Thank you, Kavita, for the great introduction. I thank you all for giving me this opportunity to talk in this CREST webinar series in memory of Padma Sri Dr. Kakals Baragaru. I learned a lot from Dr. Kakals Baragaru, as many of you. When I was an MD radiology resident, a postgraduate resident at Usmania, after finishing the work at the hospital, we used to get onto our two wheelers, rush to Nizams in the afternoon to be in time for the afternoon case discussions and lectures and case presentations. And uh, we learned a lot during those meetings. And also, I had uh, the free access to every uh, thing in the department, uh, all the aspects, all the services of the department. Um, and also, I learned a lot from uh, other, uh, my seniors like Dr. Gwalabaskar, Dr. Bangdeshwarlu, Dr. Aldi Kishore, Dr. Jagan, Dr. Subalakshmi Murthy, Dr. Ram Murthy, Dr. Komaration, <clears throat> to mention a few. And also there used to be a library, a radiology library, that used to have thousands of hard copy x-rays that were brought over by Dr. Subaragaru from US when he came to India. And they were all well categorized, well kept, and uh, uh, any disease, take any disease, and uh, we used to have an example of uh, uh, x-ray for the disease uh, in that library. And we used to spend a lot of time. We learned a lot in that uh, uh, library in addition to uh, the uh, lectures and uh, discussions. Today, I would like to uh, talk about uh, interventional management of hemodialysis accesses. I picked this topic because I do a lot of these procedures and also I feel that this is underutilized service in India. Disease prevalence in USA, more than half a million patients are on dialysis. Every year more than 150,000 dialysis access interventions are performed. Incidence of access failure is 0.8 episodes per patient per year. It is the most common reason for hospitalization of the dialysis patient. And this is a picture of the dialysis machine uh, that is used uh, to dialyze a patient. This takes up the function of a kidney. And patient is connected to this machine via two lines, a arterial line and a venous line. And uh, via the arterial line, the blood is aspirated and run through these uh, various tubes and filters. And then after cl uh, clearing the blood, it is injected back into the system via the venous line. So you can set the speed at which you want to dialyze for usually around 400 or 500 milliliters per minute, depending on the patient, <coughs> patient size and uh, requirement. And uh, the say, machine can measure the pressures in the system on the arterial side and venous side. So that is, um, that is a good indicator of what is happening. And if there is an outflow stenosis, the venous pressure will be high. If there is arterial uh, stenosis, uh, the venous suction pressure will be high. What are the different options we have for hemodialysis? Short and long-term catheters, fistulas, and grafts. Short-term catheters, these are used in urgent situations and they can be in place for about seven to 10 days and uh, they can be used via jugular vein or the femoral vein. You need uh, ultrasound guided place, uh, guidance for placement, but sometimes uh, even that may not be necessary. And the catheter can be used right now. And uh, so this is placed in situations like ICU and emergency department where the patient needs immediate dialysis. Disadvantages like any other line, uh, any other central line, uh, disadvantages include infection, thrombosis, and central tunneled or long-term dialysis catheters. 
they can be placed either via jugular vein or the femoral vein, and they need ultrasound and fluoroscopy for placement. That means the patient needs to be taken to radiology department or to the operating room with a C-arm. They can also be used immediately, and they are meant for long-term use. They're, they're created for long-term use, but uh, as we all know, we don't want to use these catheters for long-term use. We want to use fistulas and cracks for long-term. <coughs> this catheter, uh, compared to a temporary or short-term catheter, this catheter is placed via a tunnel before ad advancing it into the vein. And uh, there is a small cuff around this catheter, which is buried into the tunnel under the skin, and uh, this stimulates tissue growth into it, and uh, that kind of creates a wall uh, to prevent infection to get in. Disadvantages are catheter thrombosis, fibrin sheet formation, catheter sepsis, central venous stenosis, and as an independent variable, there is increased risk of death compared to fistula or graft. As an interventional radiologist, we frequently uh, are asked to help with catheters that are not functioning well. This is a 63-year-old female who had three failed uh, accesses like fistulas and grafts and had a catheter placed last year. And it was exchanged last week due to poor flows. But now she again comes with poor flows. So it was exchanged just a week ago. So then wanted to see what is going on. We put a wire through the catheter, pull the catheter back into the jugular vein and inject contrast to see what's going on. And here you see a thin long tube that is filling. Instead of filling the jugular vein, brachiocephalic vein and SVC, it is filling this thin long tube, which is confirmation of a well-formed fibrin sheath. So the fibrin sheet, it is made of fibrin material uh, that develops around the catheter. And uh, when there is a significant amount of this fibrin material, uh, what happens is when it is connected to the catheter, uh, when the machine aspirates blood from the red port, the membrane is pulled into the holes and uh, it prevents proper flow. So <clears throat> what we can do, uh, we can uh, do the, disrupt this fibrin sheet by advancing a balloon over a wire and then inflating the balloon and uh, run the balloon uh, up and down a few times like that to disrupt the sheet and uh, after that you can place the new catheter and inject contrast again to see how it is and in this case as you can see good filling of the brachiocephalic vein and SVC and right atrium. Um, <clears throat> so this is how we take care of the fibrin sheet. So coming to the um, uh, long-term accesses like fistulas and grafts, what are the basic principles? Um, native fistula is preferable to a graft because fistula has longer term, longer patency rates and uh, low uh, complication rates. And uh, distal before proximal, uh, the extremity that is selected there, you want to start creating these accesses more distally before moving more proximally. For example, in, in, if you take the left upper extremity, you start near the left wrist and then move up. If the uh, Once the distal fist, uh, fistulas fail, then you move more proximally, <clears throat> like proximal forearm and distal upper arm. Use of non-dominant arm. Um, if it is a uh, right-handed patient, then you start creating these axes in the left upper extremity. And after uh, using all the possible uh, sites in the left upper extremity, then you can move on to the uh, right upper extremity. Lower extremities are less favorable because of the higher chance of infection and uh, uh, low patient acceptability. The most common fistula types are, uh, one is radial cephalic, uh, where radial artery is uh, connected to the cephalic vein. And uh, when it is created at the wrist, it is called brassia fistula and it is supposed to have the uh, um, uh, highest patency rates and lowest uh, complication rates, and, uh, and it is a very popular fistula. The uh, second most common is the brachial artery to cephalic vein uh, fistula in the upper arm, 
And the third most common is brachial artery to basilic vein in the upper arm with transposition of the vein. Fischla, uh, they have the best long-term patency rates, uh, lower frequency of stenosis, thrombosis, and infection after maturation, lower incidence of interventions after maturation. So what is this maturation? Maturation is a process uh, in, uh, in which the fistula increases in size. Um, usually when the fistula is created, the vein is two or three millimeters in diameter. But once the artery is connected to it due to increased flow, the fistula or the vein increases in size and uh, the time it takes for that vein to increase in size to a satisfactory diameter, which is six millimeters, um, that time is called maturation time and the process is called maturation. <laughs> Disadvantages are higher primary failure rate. Um, compared to a graft, uh, the uh, more fistulas are, uh, uh, have uh, complete failure. They never, uh, they never mature and they can never be used. Um, they need at least four weeks for maturation. That is a disadvantage compared to graft and higher incidence of lack of maturation or delayed maturation. So um, the, uh, the, the fistula, when it, uh, it may be patent, but it hasn't matured enough. So in that case, then you have to go in and intervene angioplasty and things like that to make it uh, start working. So this kind of uh, incidence is uh, more common with a fistula than a graft. And aneurysmal degeneration, though it is not as common as a graft, but it still can happen. Higher skill level required to cannulate. Because the fistula is not a straight tube, it is softer compared to a graft, and sometimes it can go deeper. Because of these problems, the, the skill level that is required is higher than that for a graft. Uh, lower flow rates uh, are, um, the fistulas have uh, on an average have lower flow rates than grafts. Coming to the various parts of the fistula, um, this is the uh, inflow artery, site of anastomosis. This is the swing point where the uh, vein is transected and then brought to the artery and anastomosed. And the next part is the cannulation zone. This is the zone that is used for placing dialysis needles. And then the outflow vein than the central veins. This is a good example of a matured fistula. Uh, this is a radial to cephalic fistula. As you can uh, see and also feel, uh, the vein has well developed and easy to identify and locate. And uh, it's a satisfactory caliber to place a, a 15 gauge needle. Uh, and it's enough length to place two needles uh, for dialysis. The Doppler uh, is very commonly used for fistula evaluation, whether it is for maturation or even after maturation for monitoring. And um, in this case, uh, in, in this image, you can see, you can measure the depth of the fistula from the skin to the fistula. You can measure the diameter of the fistula, and you can also measure the uh, flow volumes. And in this particular case, the flow volume is 1,112 milliliters per minute. And uh, if you look at the rule of six, which is um, what is required for a fistula uh, to be designated as a matured fistula, is at six weeks of creation, we want the diameter to be six millimeters, depth to less than six millimeters, and the flow rate to be 600 milliliters per minute or more. Well, in non-maturing fistula, uh, what are the um, uh, reasons behind uh, uh, non-maturation? Um, these are stenosis, occlusion, and the presence of branches. Stenosis, this is an example. Um, this is the artery, anastomosis, and the vein. Uh, here you can see there's a high-grade stenosis in the juxta anastomotic region. Uh, the uh, next reason is occlusion. Um, so in this example, this is the artery, anastomosis, and this is the fistula. When you follow it up here, you can see that it's completely occluded. And uh, you know, we expect uh, normally this vein should extend like this. 
and uh, uh, you know in, in this particular case is completely occluded and the next common cause is branches um, in the presence of branches the branches can um, take the blood away from the fistula body uh, resulting in a lack of maturation of the fistula. Uh, this is the ultrasound uh, picture of that first example uh, due to stenosis uh, where the fistula has not matured yet and uh, this is the uh, total vein diameter but as you can see I hope it is projecting well there is uh, a thickening of the walls on either side and uh, the actual lumen is measured to be 1.5 millimeters what can we do? Uh, we can place a sheath and then place a balloon and go ahead and do angioplasty. And this is how it looks after angioplasty. And uh, this can be performed in multiple steps for the fistula to grow to its uh, size, uh, required size. Uh, so you may start off with a three millimeter or four millimeter balloon, then you bring the patient back in two weeks and do a five millimeter or six millimeter balloon. So you can do that. Uh, and uh, to achieve increased flow so that uh, the fistula can mature in time. The next example is occluded fistula. Uh, here, uh, you know, this is where the fistula is completely occluded. Uh, what we can do, if you do careful uh, ultrasound evaluation and you follow the occluded segment and more proximally, Normally, you will see a, um, uh, a reformatted uh, distal portion of the vein. So what you can do, um, you can place a sheet there and with the help of a, a catheter, you can advance a wire by careful negotiation through the occluded segment. And once the wire enters the uh, patent proximal portion, then you can place a balloon and dilate that occluded segment and this is how it looks after angioplasty uh, and uh, uh, this patient you can uh, bring the patient back in two weeks and do additional angioplasty using a larger balloon uh, so that uh, you know you can uh, gradually increase the size of the fistula and rarely um, uh, you may even have to put a stent in uh, especially when you're dealing with an occluded segment Fistula branches, when there are branches like this, you know, a surgeon can uh, ligate these branches or an interventional radiologist can go ahead and uh, place a catheter selectively into these veins and uh, release coils to embolize them. Once the fistula has matured, are we out of the woods? No. Even a matured fistula can, uh, needs to be monitored because it can develop uh, you know, complications like stenosis, aneurysm, infection, etc. So every time the patient comes for dialysis, the dialysis taker or nurse are supposed to examine the fistula or graft and see uh, whether there are any uh, signs of uh, failure. Um, uh, the, like one is an extremity edema. If there is a central venous stenosis, the patient can present with extremity edema. And the next one is thrill. Um, thrill is a vibration feeling that you feel when you place your hand on the fistula, which is flowing freely without any uh, obstruction. And uh, so this thrill can get weaker and sometimes it can become completely pulsatile when there is an outflow stenosis. Failure to collapse when the arm is elevated. So when there is an outflow stenosis, when you uh, raise the arm, the fistula fails to collapse. Uh, or sometimes there can be excessive collapse if, in case of uh, inflow stenosis. <clears throat> Aneurysm formation, uh, you, know, you need to look for and then look for any signs of uh, uh, you know, future rupture, uh, you know, such as stretching of the skin, scarring of the skin, scab formation etc. And during dialysis, uh, when you're placing needles, there can be new difficulty in cannulation. Uh, this, is, um, uh, this is a very good sign that there can be some stenosis that is developing in the area where you're having trouble putting the needles in. Aspiration of clots, 
<clears throat> this is either the fistula is clotted or um, sometimes when the lumen is narrow uh, and uh, the, or the flow is very slow, then when you put the needle and the, 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 uh, uh, the flow backwards into the needle is slow enough that uh, the blood in the needle clots. And uh, you know that kind of presents as aspirating clots. Um, inability to achieve the target dialysis blood flow. Um, uh, you know, you see, we are setting the uh, patient, setting the machine uh, to run at a certain speed. Uh, you know, 300, 400, 500 milliliters per minute, depending on the patient's requirement. But if the machine is not able to achieve that blood flow, then you can suspect that there is a uh, blockage. There is a stenosis, prolonged bleeding. Uh, beyond usual for the patient. So after dialysis, you remove the needles, apply pressure to obtain hemostasis, and uh, normally it takes five to 10 minutes for it to stop bleeding. But if it is taking longer, like 20 minutes or 30 minutes, that usually means there is an outflow stenosis. Decrease the clearance. Uh, so we use a formula called KT over V where K is the urea clearance rate, V is the urea distribution volume, T is the time spent dialyzing. Uh, so using this formula, um, uh, you can evaluate the uh, uh, blood sample for the uh, how good the clearance is. When this clearance ratio uh, falls uh, by more than 0 0.2 units, then you suspect that uh, there is a problem, there is a stenosis that is developing. And elevated dynamic pressure. Um, for example, uh, you know when you're running this dialysis, and uh, uh, you know, the, the machine can uh, measure the pressures in the system on the arterial side and the venous side. And for example, when you're running it at 400 ml per minute, uh, you expect the uh, venous side uh, pressure to be half of that flow rate. If it is 400, 200 uh, pressure. And if it is 500 ml per minute, uh, then you expect the pressure to be not more than 250 millimeters of mercury. So when this uh, pressure increases, then you suspect uh, in, any stenosis that is developing. And uh, similarly on the arterial side also. Uh, recirculation, this is the amount of mix-up that is happening in the circulation, <coughs> in the circuit. Um, so, the, when the cleared blood is you know, injected back into the system onto the venous side, there is always some mixture of that cleared blood with the incoming uncleared blood. And uh, this mixture is uh, normally less than 10%. If this, and so, this recirculation, if it is more than 10%, then you can suspect that there is a stenosis. <clears throat> this is an example of uh, arm elevation. Uh, you can see this uh, fistula. Um, uh, when the arm is elevated, there is absolutely no uh, sign of collapse of this fistula. So you can suspect an outflow stenosis. And uh, what are these stenoses in these dialysis circuits? Um, these stenoses are uh, mostly due to neointimal hyperplasia. And the neointimal hyperplasia is um, uh, the, the, what happens is the uh, smooth muscle cells from the media, they migrate to the intima and then they proliferate in the intima, causing the intimal thickening. And when the intima thickens uh, inward, uh, you get compromise of the lumen. And uh, cross-section images of a gross specimen uh, of neointimal hyperplasia, you can see this is the vessel wall and all this white material that is the intimal hyperplasia. And uh, as you can see, as this hyperplasia increases, uh, then the lumen decreases and uh, when it comes to a tight uh, point like this, uh, there is no more anti-grade flow happening and then uh, the fistula clots. <clears throat> so this stenosis can happen anywhere in the dialysis circuit, not only in the area where we are placing the needles, but even more distally uh, in, in the outflow vein, the cephalic arch, the central vein. So this, this can develop spontaneously. And uh, so this is an example of a stenosis in a matured fistula. This is a 70-year-old male with left upper arm fistula that was created three years ago. He, ha he presents with prolonged bleeding, aneurysm formation with large scab, and pulsatile flow. 
So when we did the angiogram, you can see aneurysmal deterioration and then a high grade stenosis of the outflow. You put a balloon, go ahead and angioplasty. We used a nine millimeter balloon and uh, there is a, a, a mild to moderate degree recoil, uh, but uh, you, know, you can evaluate the flow by placing your fingers on the fistula. And if you are able to feel a nice thrill, that means the flow is satisfactory for dialysis. And, um, but this patient, uh, he came back six months later with pain and increasing uh, size of the aneurysm. And uh, here you can see um, the aneurysm has uh, started uh, increasing in size and then in fact it is developing another bump on top of it. Uh, and uh, that's a potential uh, site of uh, uh, more complications in future and rupture. Uh, so we wanted to be more aggressive at this point and uh, went ahead and did some pre-dilatation, put a covered stent. In this case, we used a 10 millimeter fluency and then you dilate the stent uh, to the appropriate diameter, um, uh, to the 10 millimeter diameter. So this patient in this uh, stenosis you know, looks good after uh, a couple of years now and uh, very well patent without any sign of stenosis. And uh, coming to the balloons, um, these balloons come in different diameters and lengths and uh, plain balloon and drug-coated balloon. Uh, <clears throat> the drug-coated balloon is what is being um, uh, tested. Uh, in fact, uh, the, there are uh, a lot of positive results uh, with this drug-coated balloon. Uh, the, pa the balloon is coated with paclitaxel and uh, uh, when you dilate this balloon in the area of the stenosis, the, the drug is deposited into the intima at the site of stenosis and uh, it is supposed to inhibit the um, neointimal hyperplasia. Coming to stents, there are mainly two different kinds, a bare metal stent and a covered stent. Uh, bare metal stents are in uh, nitinol mesh and they are self-expanding stents, <clears throat> but they are notorious to uh, stimulate aggressive neointimal hyperplasia. Uh, so, when you're trying to treat uh, neointimal hyperplasia, uh, this is not the best choice to use. Um, the, the best choice is covered stent, where this is again a night null mesh with a PTFE cover. And this prevents uh, the intimal hyperplasia uh, projecting into the lumen uh, and also uh, the, uh, the intimal hyperplasia itself is uh, decreased. Uh, one special mention is cephalic arch stenosis. Um, because of uh, uh, you know, what is presumed to be because of the anatomy, uh, this uh, cephalic arch stenosis is uh, uh, supposed to be, is very common uh, in this location and sometimes the very stubborn stenosis too. Uh, <coughs> Um, if you look at the anatomy in this region, um, the, the vein has uh, external compression by deltopectoral and clavipectoral, claviculopectoral fascia and pectoralis major. And uh, the angle at which the cephalic arch joins the axillary vein creates kind of a turbulence resulting in intimal hyperplasia. Also, there are uh, um, uh, more number of valves in this region compared to the rest of the vein. So these are uh, some of the uh, hypotheses for uh, higher incidence of stenosis in this region. Uh, <clears throat> the only absolute contraindication to percutaneous intervention is presence of infection. And in fact, when there is infection at the site, uh, even dialysis needle placement is contraindicated and patient is going to need a, a, a catheter uh, until this infection is under control. Coming to the aneurysms, Aneurysms are of two kinds, the um, true aneurysm and uh, you know, false aneurysm. Uh, this is an example of a true aneurysm where the, uh, uh, all the layers of the uh, vessel are uh, involved. And uh, uh, when there is an outflow stenosis, there's increased pressure in the system that creates the outward uh, uh, dilatation of the uh, uh, axis, and especially in the area where uh, you're placing needles on a regular basis 
uh, uh, the aneurysm degeneration is much higher. And uh, uh, if you don't fix the outflow stenosis, this aneurysm keeps growing and uh, get into complications. And this is an example of uh, a false aneurysm. Um, when there is a uh, stenosis more distally and at the site of needles, then the, uh, because of the increased pressure in the system, the blood tends to escape out of the vessel and uh, create a, a pseudo aneurysm. Uh, this, uh, um, when we did the angiogram on this patient, uh, here you can see there's a stenosis here and then a puff of contrast that is uh, getting into the aneurysm. And we can put a balloon and treat the uh, stenosis and uh, hope that the aneurysm does not get any bigger. <clears throat> this is a very ominous sign, um, uh, a complication of uh, aneurysm uh, where um, if we keep on placing needles in the same location and uh, in the area of the uh, skin stretching, scarring, uh, then uh, there comes a point where the skin is not able to heal the, uh, heal the needle site and it is filled with a blood clot and uh, that forms a scab. And uh, when uh, these scabs are large enough, uh, and the uh, scab falls off, then the patient will start bleeding. So this is a very dangerous situation. And whenever we see something like this, uh, we need to either do immediate percutaneous intervention or surgical intervention to take care of the outflow stenosis, which usually uh, there is an outflow stenosis that is uh, uh, resulting in this situation and uh, uh, help the patient. Uh, coming to central venous stenosis, um, this is an example of a left subclavian vein stenosis. There's a 55-year-old male, left upper arm, matured fistula, and he comes with left upper extremity swelling. When you did the uh, angiogram here, you can see the cephalic arch, uh, axillary vein, and uh, stenosis of the subclavian vein with multiple large collaterals. Uh, you can go ahead and angioplasty, dilate it, and uh, you expect this. Uh, uh, these uh, collateral vessels to decrease in number. But in this particular patient, you still see filling of the collateral vessels. So further examination, you can see that there is a second stenosis of the brachiocephalic vein. So you can go ahead and angioplasty that with uh, another known. <clears throat> another special mention is um, steel syndrome. This is a 47-year-old male patient, uh, end-stage renal disease, hypertension, uh, diabetes mellitus, uh, hypercholesterolemia, coronary artery disease, peripheral arterial disease, former smoker, and he has a left upper arm fistula that was created about 12 years ago, and he had some prior interventions, but currently the fistula is working well, but he comes with pain in the left hand and left fingers with a non-healing ulcer of the middle finger. Um, so when we did the angiogram, uh, we wanted to evaluate the forearm arterial uh, vasculature. So I placed the catheter from the fistula across the anastomosis uh, into the radial artery and then advanced the catheter into the brachial artery and inject contrast. And uh, here you can see filling of all three vessels in the forearm. And uh, uh, ulnar artery demonstrates a significant stenosis at the wrist and additionally, uh, there are stenosis involving the deep palmar branch of the radial and uh, some digital arteries are also not feeling well. Uh, so the patient does have small vessel disease, uh, but uh, what can we do to help this patient? Uh, this stenosis here in the ulnar artery is accessible, so we go ahead and put a two, two millimeter balloon and angioplasty it to improve the circulation. So the dialysis axis associated with steel syndrome, the incidence is about 10% of brachial artery fistulas, 10 times higher than wrist fistulas. And the underlying etiology, uh, it can be arterial occlusive disease, excess blood flow through the AV fistula, which is called a true steel syndrome, a lack of arterial adaptation or collateral flow, risk factors include increasing age, female population, diabetes, prosthetic grafts, and uh, multiple prior access procedures. There are multiple uh, surgical options uh, for steel syndrome. 
it can be as simple as putting a band around the uh, uh, proximal fistula to decrease the flow into the fistula or these are other uh, procedures that involve placement of a graft uh, like drill, Rudy and Pi procedures. And uh, there is a Miller procedure uh, which uh, can be done percutaneously. Um, uh, it is similar to banding but it can be done percutaneously. <coughs> uh, grafts, coming to the grafts, uh, there are some patients who don't have a vein that is uh, at least two millimeters. So in these patients we need, uh, we can place grafts. Um, so uh, they come, they, they, you can put them in different configurations and uh, the materials used in grafts are PTFE, polyurethane, dacron, and bovine carotid artery. Advantages, lower initial technical failure. Uh, we talked about this when we talked about fistulas. In fistulas have uh, higher primary failure rate. Uh, so some fistulas will never uh, function and they're never used. Uh, and whereas, uh, you know, it can happen with graft, but it's uh, much rare compared to a fistula. And shorter maturation period, uh, for a fistula, you need at least four weeks for maturation, whereas a graft, um, you know, maybe a week or two, or uh, uh, sometimes with some of these grafts, you can use them the same day or the next day. And uh, use of cannulation, uh, it's, it needs uh, uh, lesser skills compared to uh, fistula cannulation because, um, you know, there is uh, uh, you know, a nice form material of this graft is easily palpable. And uh, these, since these are placed surgically, uh, we know where to, where to place these. So they're placed you know, right under the skin and easy to palpate, easy to locate. And then uh, the diameter is a good size to start with. So cannulation is easier. The disadvantages, they're expensive. Uh, thrombosis is 10 times more common than fistulas. Infection rates are higher. Uh, aneurysm formation, uh, again, incidence is higher compared to fistulas. And overall, there is limited lifespan uh, compared to fistulas. <laughs> With these grafts, uh, one special mention is the venous anastomotic stenosis. Um, so here, this is the artery, arterial anastomosis, graft body, venous anastomosis, and the outflow vein. Uh, so it is very common to identify, I mean, find uh, stenosis at the venous anastomosis of uh, these grafts. It's not that common at the arterial anastomosis, but very common at the venous anastomosis. And this is again because of the uh, internal hyperplasia. And as interventional radiologists, we can do angioplasty with a balloon, or if it is if that stenosis is coming back too soon, then we can put a stent. Anytime we are doing angioplasty, uh, we have to be ready for this complication, which is a rupture of the vessel. Um, in this case, you know, here, uh, this is the venous anastomosis and you have a, a significant stenosis and after angioplasty, you can, uh, an injection of contrast, you can see the significant extravasation of contrast into the tissues. Uh, so what you do at this point is immediately you reinflate the balloon in the area and uh, um, uh, keep it inflated for a longer time, like two to three minutes and uh, then check again. And a lot of times that takes care of the problem that uh, kind of stops the, uh, the uh, extravasation. Uh, and sometimes uh, if it doesn't solve the problem, you may have to put a stent, either a covered stent or sometimes even a bare metal stent also can help uh, uh, so that uh, um, there is, you, you create a, uh, a channel uh, with less resistance so that and the blood flows through the stand into the outflow vein rather than uh, bleeding into the tissues. Coming to thrombos the axes, um, so the different ways of treating a thrombos the axis uh, are uh, pharmacologic thrombolysis, mechanical thrombectomy, aspiration thrombectomy. Pharmacologic thrombolysis is injecting TPA into the axis. Uh, usually about one to six milligrams is injected and uh, you can wait for 15 to 20 minutes for uh, the TPA to lyse the thrombus and then uh, and, and go ahead and place a catheter and see what's going on and identify the problem and treat it. 
Um, uh, and uh, there is another method called pulse spray technique. Um, the mechanical thrombectomy, there are multiple devices that can be used to break up the clot into multiple small fragments. And uh, those are Teratola, Angiojet, Amplads, etc. Uh, Angiojet, in fact, is a combination of a mechanical thrombectomy and pharmacologic thrombolysis, uh, where you also use some TPA. Um, aspiration thrombectomy, this can be done uh, using uh, large bore uh, sheets, uh, where you can aspirate the clot through the sheet. Um, the arterial plug, it needs a special mention. Um, uh, in a thrombosed axis at the arterial end, you will see a small um, uh, platelet-rich white thrombus uh, that kind of plugs the, uh, the axis, uh, and uh, it may not respond to uh, thrombolysis, so it needs to be manually uh, uh, removed using a, uh, a thrombectomy or a malectomy catheter. Um, <clears throat> this is an example of a thrombosed axis. Uh, what we do is we place two sheets into the thrombosed axis uh, and in, in, you know, facing each other. And then uh, whether you want to do uh, TPA thrombolysis or mechanical thrombectomy, um, uh, you do uh, with mechanical thrombectomy, um, uh, use the different devices. And uh, after that, you go ahead and put a uh, catheter into the artery, inject contrast, and... Uh, uh, that will uh, show you what is uh, underlying stenosis that is causing this problem. And many times we, use, we see multiple stenosis. It is hard to figure out which one is the main culprit. But you go ahead and uh, open up all the stenosis. And this is a picture of the uh, Teratola device. Uh, this is like a basket that is connected to a motor. And it is... Uh, it rotates uh, uh, rapidly, uh, turning the motor, and it breaks up the clot into multiple small fragments. <clears throat> uh, alternative accesses, when uh, a patient uh, has occluded central veins and occluded bilateral femoral veins, then uh, you may have to put a catheter in the IVC using translumbar approach. And this is done either under fluoroscopic guidance or uh, CT guidance. Uh, a needle is placed into the IVC, advance a wire, and then uh, thread a catheter over uh, a pillow of sheets. And the catheter is secured with the tip uh, in the upper portion of the IVC. So in summary, um, uh, identify early signs of stenosis. And uh, fistula has the longest life. And try to avoid catheters because of the known complication rates and uh, uh, low uh, flow rates and uh, using interventional techniques, life of the axis and patient's lifespan can be prolonged significantly. Now I would like to open the forum uh, for any uh, questions and answers.